That was a terrific panel from whom we heard just a few minutes ago. And we have uh, an, an equally uh, important and instructive and entertaining panel uh, on the issue of equality. Uh, you know, we, ha we have a, an academic chair here uh, for the teaching and study of freedom and equality. I thought those were rather broad issues. I happen to be the first uh, appointee to that, to that chair, but indeed we're dealing with those issues precisely this morning, and right we should, because that's such an important part of what the Constitution uh, and the Supreme Court uh, is all about. Uh, all of our panelists ha have a connection uh, with, the, with the justice, as you might guess. I want to mention that, that uh, connection before going on and introducing them in a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Siegel uh, was a clerk for the 2000 term uh, w w with the justice. Um, he uh, 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 has uh, written uh, about the justice in an article with a long title, uh, Equal Protection Unmodified, Justice John Paul Stevens and the Case for the Unmediated unme <laughs> Constitutional Protection. Uh, so obviously a, a long relationship. Um, and uh, our own uh, Professor uh, Amon, uh, clerked in the uh, 1988 uh, term, uh, wrote an article, uh, John Paul Stevens, Human, Human Rights Just Judge, uh, and indeed has now uh, beginning to do some research on what uh, will be called Justice and John Paul Stevens, a biography. So she's got her work uh, cut out for her. Uh, and as you might guess, uh, Teresa Wynne uh, Roseborough, who will be the, the last to speak today, uh, also clerked uh, for, for the judge in the 1987 uh, term. Uh, so so all, of the, all of the folk who are here in one way or another have had that close relationship uh, with, uh, with the justice. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Siegel will be the first one to speak uh, uh, th this morning, and, and he will speak about the law, about the, the, the doctrinal notions uh, behind the writings uh, uh, of the justice. He is presently, and has been since 2007, the associate professor uh, at the Seattle University School of Law, which I visited not long ago. It's a wonder wonderful school. Uh, before that, he was in private practice. Then he was a professor at South Carolina uh, School of Law. And he uh, writes uh, on matters pertaining to the Constitution, legal history, and criminal procedure. Uh, he's been uh, a member of the American Bar Association Death Penalty Assessment Team, so again, a relationship to the interest that the justice has had, a member of the Young Scholars and Program Committee of the Southeastern Association of Law Schools, uh, and, uh, and he uh, writes for the public, which I think is always good for, for, for law professors. So he wrote, for example, a, a popular piece entitled, Nice Disguise, Aliotos <coughs> Frightening geniality. <laughs> so yeah, folks would be very nice personally, but look at their record. Uh, that, 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 uh, that's just my own editorial comment. <laughs> uh, and and uh, then, then, then we have we will have as our second speaker uh, our own uh, Diane Marie Amon, who uh, presently, of course, is, is pro professor of law here at the at the law school and is the director of the relatively new California International Law Center. Has put together a, a wonderful set of professors and others uh, who will be expanding the interest that we in this law school have in international law and activity. Uh, uh, before that, she uh, uh, has uh, written uh, and her articles have appeared in languages other than English, including French and Italian. We'll be teaching her Spanish soon. Uh, and, uh, and has taught in France, uh, in, uh, uh, in Ireland, uh, and even in Southern California, as well as in Berkeley. Uh, the, uh, she has been, of course, the faculty advisor for this symposium, and I must say has done a wonderful job at has have, has have the students and the folk they've gotten here. Uh, what you may not know is that for a long time she said good morning to me every single day. Uh, and I said, how could that be? Because I don't see you that often. He says, well, she says, I was at Berkeley as, as a scholar teaching and studying, and I'd go to the library every day. And there's a big picture of you because, because, <laughs> because Berkeley has put up photographs and, and paintings of all of their graduates who have been on the California Supreme Court. So my picture's there. So when she go to the library, she says, good morning, Cruz. So, 
and, 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 and I was also going to tell you, I, uh, 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 Professor Siegel, that uh, he uh, will be dealing some uh, with, with the uh, problems in the Seattle schools, and he has a personal interest because two of his own children are attending uh, th those schools. And with respect to uh, our third speaker, Teresa Wynn uh, Roseboro, uh, she is presently and has been since 2006 uh, the senior chief litigation counsel for MetLife. Uh, she uh, uh, rules over uh, 62 associates, and I understand that it hasn't filed for bankruptcy or anything. Here. <laughs> so so, so that, that's, that's very good. Anybody that can keep a job nowadays is doing pr pr pretty, pretty well that, there. Uh, before that, she served as deputy attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, in the U.S. Justice Department. Uh, she was a litigator at the trial level, the, uh, so the appellate level, and Supreme Court level, including uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. And she participated, of interest to me, in a case called Gorby Bush, of which you may have heard. Uh, she's been a member for some time now of the Board of Advisors of the Center for Civil Rights, uh, member of the Board of Directors of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, uh, and has appeared in many uh, uh, talk shows uh, and uh, in television and in the media. Uh, in, nine, in 2003, uh, she was voted the American lawyer uh, highest performing attorneys under 45. Are you still under 45? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and she, uh, she tells me that she's a lifelong Girl Scout and she has a 16 year old girl who controls her life. So, <laughs> so, so with that, I'd like to, to turn to Professor Siegel. And incidentally, we'll speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll ask some questions, and hopefully we'll have time, we'll have time for the audience to ask some questions. Uh, Professor Siegel. Thank you, Professor Reynoso. Thank you, Professor Hammond, Dean Johnson, for hosting this event and for inviting me to participate. Um, it's really great to be here with all these people, with the Association for the Justice, to be here with the Justice in Spirit. Um, as uh, Professor Reynoso mentioned, three years ago I published a piece in the Ford and Law Review in that same symposium that was cited earlier, um, giving an overarching view of the justice's equal protection jurisprudence um, with that long title that was mentioned. Um, today I want to do three things. Um, I want to briefly summarize what I said in the Fordham piece to try to lay a foundation for this panel. Then I want to talk about and apply my writings to the, the biggest equal protection case to come down in the intervening three years. Um, Parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District case, the case that challenged um, race conscious student assignment plans in Seattle and Louisville, Kentucky. And then finally, I want to discuss the role of righteous anger in constitutional discourse, and in particular in the writings of Supreme Court justices. Um, it may sound a little odd, but I think it's an appropriate topic for several reasons. Um, first, I think it helps us focus on what is most notable about the Picks case, the Seattle Schools case which is the passion of the dissents. Um, second of all, I think it's kind of appropriate to our location. We're here in King Hall, part of the celebration of the 40th anniversary. Um, Martin Luther King often cited as the prime example of the power of righteous anger. Um, we're here the day after the oral argument, um, powerful oral arguments yesterday in the California Supreme Court on the California marriage cases, another area where righteous anger comes to the forefront. Um, most importantly for our subject, I think focusing in on this helps us round out the portrait of, portrait of Justice Stevens um, in the tributes and symposiums like this and others. Um, the symposiums tend to focus on the calmness, the dispassion, the judgment of Justice Stevens, all of which are crucial aspects of his character. Um, but sometimes they focus there at the expense of what I like to call his steel, his power, um, his conviction. Um, anyone who's been a law clerk to Justice Stevens appreciates the fact, one of his defining characteristics, that he'll sit and he will listen to rational argument. He wants to hear what you have to say about cases. He'll talk to you. But then you reach a point where his countenance changes ever so slightly. His eye is set. Um, if you don't get the hint, he starts patting his arms, as some of the law clerks will tell you. Uh, where he's made up his mind, and he's heard what, he's, what he needs to hear, and he's decided what he wants to decide. And the power of that conviction comes through in his writings. My term, and I assume it's true most terms, there were three or four or five incidents where against the advice of everybody else or without asking for the advice of everybody else, he repaired to his office 
and typed out a one-page memo or a one-page concurrence or a one-page dissent um, that he may or may not have circulated, may have had different goals in mind, but often with strikingly strong results from the court or um, just to achieve something, something he had to say, some conviction. So I think that focusing in that, putting that into the literature about Justice Stevens helps nicely to balance the picture. Um, my Fordham piece posits a theory of Justice Stevens' jurisprudence, equal protection jurisprudence, that's focused on the fact that he both rejects the e existing three-tiered equal protection jurisprudence, the equal protection framework, and then unlike other people who reject that jurisprudence, he doesn't try to replace the framework with some equally or more complicated set of mediating doctrines. Um, instead, instead of developing balancing tests or presumptions or multi-factor lists, he practices or tries to practice something approaching what I call unmediated constitutional interpretation. He attempts as best as possible in every case to apply unmediated judicial judgment to the constitutional text and the constitutional values. A little more concretely, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, he spends a lot of time focusing, uh, focusing on developing and articulating a normative vision of the Equal Protection Clause, <coughs> part of his opinions at the front of his opinions. He does it slightly differently in every case, but I think that the one that's most prominent, I think it's uh, what Professor Amin's gonna talk about in particular, is his belief that ultimately, the Equal Protection Clause is a test of whether a particular law is the kind of law that an impartial sovereign would adopt. He treats that question as the polar star in his interpretation and his analysis. He never really deviates very far from that. In answering each question, he gives us detailed and case-specific inquiry into whether that standard is met, a comprehensive lawyerly examination of plausible rationales for the statute, and then when he goes beyond the statute's text he uses real evidentiary eclecticism. Depending on the case, he might look at the drafting history, the history of regulations of this type, the social history of the burdened group, the consequences of the law, all of those things. Um, he's got a commitment to resolve each case based on a holistic assessment of whether the government has acted as would an impartial sovereign. Um, part of his theory, or part of his method, leads him to express explicitly frustration with the rigidity of his colleagues' equal protection methodology. He's upset that tears preclude his colleagues from taking into account salient pockets of evidence. Um, and he often derides the majority's approach, um, even sometimes when he agrees with a conclusion, using words like wooden, sterile, and misleading. Um, he thinks that the formalistic inquiry at the heart of modern equal protection jurisprudence focuses our energy on the wrong questions. That's a short and dirty summary of that article with a long title. Um, in the Seattle and Louisville schools case, uh, my thesis is that Justice Stevens's methodology allows him to see something that was obscured to a lot of people. And this is a controversial statement. It allows him to see that this was an easy case. Um, and his brief dissent explains why. Why do I say this is an easy case? I mean, lots of people who ultimately agree with me that the decision was wrong, who are more accomplished than I am, in very sophisticated works have talked about how hard this case was. Um, I want to take Justice Stevens' lead and step back a bit from the doctrinal categories and ask simply, what happened here in Seattle and, lesser, and to a lesser extent in Louisville? My focus is on Seattle because I'm there, know more about what happened, know more about the details. Um, let's talk about the history, and a lot of this history is in Justice Breyer's um, tour de force dissent. Um, in Seattle, African Americans primarily have lived historically in the central part of the city. Even there, they lived in a patchwork of white and black micro neighborhoods, you could call them. Um, the residential segregation in Seattle historically is a result of the same combination of public and private actions and public and private factors that created re residential segregation in most major northern cities. Um, Back in the middle of this century and before, the Seattle School District took any number of actions to ensure minimal integration of their schools. Um, their decisions is where to locate schools, how to size them so as to make sure they didn't overlap neighborhoods, how to draw attendance zones, what teachers to assign, all contributed to that end. Such that an internal memo that Justice Breyer quotes in his dissent, 
1956, the school board sent an internal memo that they had segregated schools. They thought they were going to have to adhere to Brown for that reason. Um, in the two decades after Brown, the school district faced multiple legal challenges accusing them of intentionally maintaining a two-track school system. Um, strong allegations along the lines that I've spelled out before. Those challenges were all settled by the school district as they were by any number of southern districts. Um, and the school district took, took voluntary efforts to desegregate using most of the methodologies available in the day, including pretty significant busing. Sometime in the 1980s, along with the rest of the country, um, out of a combination of frustration with busing, the desire to stem white flights to the suburbs and private schools, the desire to achieve and balance other educational objectives, the school district gradually moved to a school choice plan or a school choice model. The various school choice models that they used made modest use of race in their plans. Um, nothing more than an attempt to limit backsliding on the integration efforts um, as they're balancing in these other goals, as they're shifting the methodology. Um, the reality of the Seattle schools today is that, um, particularly at the elementary level, Seattle still operates for complicated public and private lessons reasons a two-tier school system, particularly in the central cluster where I live, um, which is the most racially and ethnically diverse area of the city. There are mostly white schools, and there are mostly black schools. This is in large part a legacy of district policies to build small elementary schools near each other, to draw attendance zones in particular ways. Um, it's exacerbated by a Byzantine choice system right now that allows high social capital parents to migrate out of their preferred, um, their perceived, well, out of their local school if it's perceived to be, undesir perceived to be undesirable, um, but, it's, but also establishes strong entitlements based on proximity to the school. In some ways, it combines two highly segregative mechanisms. Resident it mirrors me residential segregation but allows high social capital parents to opt out of what would otherwise be the residentially assigned school. Um, a series of policies that the schools have today mark the schools, let people know immediately which of the two tracks the schools are on, um, and discourage people from sending children, children on, others, on other tracks. The uniform policies tend to be different at predominantly white and black schools. Um, predominantly white schools in the Central Cluster Elementary have a lot more recess some of the African -American, African American schools don't even have recess. The discipline policies are different. The expectations that are imbued in the students are different. So there really is this ongoing problem in the school. In this historical context, the minor efforts of the school district to ameliorate the resegregative effects of a school choice plan were, in many ways, the least that they could do. The quirk of the litigation posture of this case was that it was no one's interest to tell this story. The Seattle School District, who was trying to defend the constitutionality of their own efforts, in no way wanted to drag their own history before the court and to trash their predecessors in terms of the segregative efforts. And certainly the plaintiffs had no interest in that because they didn't want to establish that the schools may have been historically segregated. To the dissenter's credit, all four of the dissenters in this case figured out this history understood the deeper context. Um, and Justice Breyer's tour de force dissent was in many ways an attempt to go back to the record in Seattle and to do a similar thing in Louisville and to explain the true context of this case. Um, to return to Justice Stevens after this digression into Seattle, um, the contrast between his dissent and Justice Breyer's is interesting. Though they agree on the history and they ultimately agree on most of the law, the case is easier for Justice Stevens. He can do in four or five pages what it takes Justice Breyer, what, 70 or 80 to do. Um, because his methodology allows him to go right to the evidence, to go right to what's at stake. Whereas the others have to fit it in to struggle to figure out how it fits into the pre-existing framework, to pre-existing categories of de jure and de facto, to pre-existing questions of strict scrutiny versus not strict scrutiny. There's an elegant simplicity to Justice Stevens' dissent. What his dissent says is, this is an easy case. An impartial sovereign is acting in a responsible way to deal with complicated problems and ameliorate an ongoing historical wrong in which it was complicit. We should not only allow it, but we should applaud it. 
Um, he says that the only excuse for treating this as anything other than an easy case is, and he uses the same words that I talked about in the Fordham article, the wooden formalism of modern equal protection analysis um, that allows the court to refuse to acknowledge the obvious, to refuse to acknowledge important pockets of evidence, and requires them to rigidly adhere to doctrinal categories even when they push to questions that are antithetical to the text and the values of the Equal Protection Clause. I think it's a powerful piece of evidence um, for the wisdom, the common sense, as someone said, of Justice Stevens' methodologies. So what do you do with that if you're Justice Stevens, or even if you're Justice Breyer in this case, who ultimately ends up in the same place? What's their reaction? What's their emotion in this case? How did they behave? Um, I like to characterize their dissents in this case as being different than many other cases because they express what I call a righteous anger. How do you define that? Well, I think it's a reaction. What are the requisites of righteous anger? Well, righteous anger is a belief that in a crucially important case, the court got things really wrong for reasons that are um, related to some deeper flaw in their values, their ideology, or their jurisprudence, um, and they should have known better. Those are kind of the intellectual requisites, but there's something more to that. Those are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Um, there's also a subjective element, a genuine feeling of actual provocation or anger that characterizes cases of righteous anger. And I think you can see that in the justice's opinion, in the justice's dissents. But it's interesting how it expresses itself. And when justices feel that way, they have this kind of righteous anger, or other constitutional thinkers have this kind of righteous anger, how do they proceed? How should they proceed? Well, there's a fundamental choice at the beginning. Do you harness or suppress this indignation, right? You can understand why sometimes it's important, but you can also understand why it pushes against traditional, no traditional notions of the judicial role. Well, I think increasingly, and we can attribute it to changing culture on the Supreme Court, we can increasing, attribute it to um, increasing attention to hot button cultural issues, something about the confirmation process, you can lay blame at the Reagan Justice Department if you want, or at Justice Scalia. Um, <coughs> But increasingly, justice on both sides have tried to harness their righteous indignation or their righteous anger in constitutional cases um, with a variety of goals, to keep the issues alive within the court, to draw the attention of the general public to cases, to draw Congress's attention if it's a statutory case, um, to draw the attention of later courts, and largely, I think, to appeal to the court of history, right? To say, we knew that this was wrong. We knew that this was putting us on the wrong course. But then that leads to the question, how do you express that righteous anger? How is a responsible common law judge, someone who really believes in the role, believes in the decorum of the court to express that? Um, you can follow the path of Justice Scalia, right? Um, where um, sarcasm comes into the decision, where invective characterizes the decision when he feels that way, um, attacks on the integrity and the ability of colleagues, and we all slip into that to some extent. No justice, certainly no commentator, um, and few judges or justices are immune to that. Um, I want to submit that Justice Stevens represents another approach here, and it's not an approach without its flaws, as I'll, as I'll mention in the end, but it is the approach of, I think he's the master of using formalized lawyerly mechanisms for expressing righteous angers, righteous anger. What are some of the mechanisms of formalized righteous anger, right? What, are the, what does a judge do? How do they signal to people in the know how angry they are? Well, one of the things that we see um, is an increasing use of oral dissents, dissents from the bench, and some people have written provocatively about that. Justice Breyer held court for a long time, one of the longest oral dissents in history in this very case. Um, appeals to other branches, sometimes explicitly. You saw that in the Lee Ledbetter case from the same term, for example. Um, Marking decisions as so deep, one of the more controversial ones is marking decisions as so deviant that you won't give stare decisis effects to them. This has happened not in every area of the law, not in many, but certainly, for example, um, the sovereign immunity revolution of the Rehnquist court was marked by that kind of persistent statement by the dissenters. The filing of opinions at procedural stages and of kinds not normally filed, uh, examples here, the dissent and the concurrence on the stay in Bush versus Gore, um, the famed and perhaps apocryphal 
um, although Linda Greenhouse probably knows the answer to this, um, dissent from, relist, from relisting supposedly written when Casey was being held in conference. Um, speaking at times when justice, or threatening to speak at times when justices normally don't. Um, one of the ones that perhaps is overblown in the popular press, but certainly comes out to some extent, is the question of whether it is a mark of anger when justices leave out respectfully when they say they dissent in a case. And for the most part, that is, um, for the most part, that's an old wives' tale or whatever the lawyerly equivalent of that is. Um, but um, you definitely see judges writing around the locution, I respectfully dissent, in cases where they can't muster the, the stomach to say that. Um, writing a disproportionate length, marshalling an evidence that goes beyond the normal record, like Justice Breyer has done in uh, the Seattle cases. Um, and one that I think is interesting is the making of uncharacteristic references, comments, personal asides intended to draw attention to the uniqueness of a particular case. Um, and in the end, that is what Justice Stevens' dissent um, in this case is going to be most famous for, right? Um, in the Seattle Schools case, Justice Stevens' five pages are famous for three references. Um, his reference at the beginning to the Anatoly France quote um, about um, you know, the law is e equal, it um, allows both the rich and the poor to sleep under bridges and beg, right? Or, prohibits them both from doing so. His um, um, conspicuous references to, the fa to opinions by judges Alex Kaczynski and Michael Boudin, neither leading liberal lights on the federal bench, as respected judges who, in the, addressing the same issue, strongly disagreed with the Supreme Court's um, approach. And most famously, his closing comment that it is my firm conviction that no members of the court that I joined in 1975 would have agreed with today's decision. And I think in some ways, but what, what, what Breyer and Stevens did in this case is use the lawyerly tools to make this as a case, mark this as a case where righteous indignation, righteous anger is the appropriate response. Now, these kinds of stylized expression of anger um, are subject to criticism from both sides. On one hand, the idea that it's inappropriate. It's not the way the judges speak. It goes too far. On the other hand, the argument that it doesn't go far enough. Um, you know, you can use Bush, v Bush versus Gore here. Many people's response to the dissents, even though they loved Justice Stevens' dissent, many people's response to the dissent and the court's behavior was, they just stole the word, they just stole the presidency and all you can do is leave out the word respectfully. <laughs> so there are criticisms of pushing at it from both sides. Um, in the paper that follows and the remarks that I'm gonna publish, I wanna explore those criticisms uh, from both sides and see if, uh, Let's see what I think about exactly whether Justice Stevens hits the right middle tone here. Um, but for today, I think it's the right place to stop. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Professor Amon will t tell us a little bit something about the justice's life, because it seems to me that where the person comes from really influences how they look at, at, at the issues of liberty and justice. Thank you, Cruz. And I want to take this opportunity, since I did not do so at the beginning, to thank everyone for coming and supporting the work that uh, the students, the incredible work the students have done to put together this program and um, the speakers who have so far been absolutely brilliant in their comments and the ones who uh, have yet to follow their brilliant comments. I very much appreciate it. Um, and I, I, I commend to you the acknowledgments page and the inside back cover of the book. You'll see that uh, many people had hands in this. The justice, of course, himself has been quite supportive, although the 12-hour uh, round trip by air proved more than his wife was willing to make, let him do, I think. <laughs> um, but also both his current uh, head secretary, Janice Harley, and Nellie Pitts, who served as his secretary for about 30 years, beginning with him on the court. Um, as well as the Federal Judicial Center that was responsible for doing the taping of the remarks. So we have many, many people to thank, clerks who are here and clerks who are not here who helped advise me on how to construct this panel. What I'd like to do is explain why, if I don't botch this, yeah, there you go, is to explain why the panels were constructed the way they are and what uh, is, is beginning to unfold. And this is essentially, um, a, a diagramming of the biographical work that I'm doing. Justice Stevens in his early days was talked about as, as an antitrust expert, um, as a common law judge, we've heard that today, as a maverick, 
often uh, pragmatic, uh, incremental, very fact-driven in the decisions that he made. And in doing the research that I did for the Fordham Symposium, I discovered, um, as, as Andrew has already pointed out, there's a normative vision that's being articulated. It's just that people weren't listening or reading it for many, many, many years. And when you actually go back and begin to glean what you can find on Westlaw in odd places like the Chicago Bar Association record, remarks that he made, there is a vision there. And at times, particularly the Miami a Cole lecture that Jeff already referenced, where it's articulated quite fully with very, very thoughtful um, engagement with thinkers like Mortimer Adler, who was one of his mentors at the University of Chicago. And so what I'm trying to do is to explore <coughs> Justice Stevens um, as a thinker and as a jurisprudence and as someone who looks at the really big issues, liberty, equality, and security, that are embedded in our Constitution and sometimes honored and sometimes not honored. And as the slide shows you, that plays out in all kinds of places. The death penalty and privacy we've already heard about. I don't think, unfortunately, today we're going to hear much about non-citizens, although I take that back. The Guantanamo cases will implicate that as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about segregation as well as affirmative action kind of issues that um, uh, Andrew has already talked about. The war on drugs, which was the war that I waged as a federal employee, um, as a defender, not as a prosecutor, may I say, um, and the current so-called war on terror. If you begin to think of those from a big picture, they all implicate an intersection of all three of those ideas. And today, what I'm going to focus on, <coughs> excuse me, is the equality prong. But because of the nature of the justice's mind, I can't stop there. Because what I'd like to present is his vision of equality as um, inextricably intertwined with, and perhaps even subsumed by, his vision of liberty. And I'd like to take you back now fully, ah, and see, I can't do my math, 61 years ago. The year is 1948. The place is Washington, D.C. In cane chairs tucked amid red, amid red velvet draping in the chamber of the US Supreme Court, clerks fresh out of law school watched as Thurgood Marshall argued that the Constitution required Oklahoma to admit Ada Lois Sipwell to its flagship law school. Though not quite 40, Marshall, who was chief counsel for the NAACP, was already well known to the justices for whom he had won his first case fully eight years earlier. One of the clerks who was present that day later recalled, Thurgood was respectful, forceful, and persuasive. In fact, so persuasive that on the following Monday, only four days after argument, the court unanimously ruled in Sipowell's favor. But a few weeks later, Marshall returned to seek a writ of mandamus, compelling the recalcitrant state to admit Sipowell, whom the court's per curiam opinion had described, and I quote, as a Negro conceitedly qualified, unquote. This clerk urged Wiley B. Rutledge to grant the extraordinary writ. The mandate of this court, the clerk wrote, directs the state to provide her, Sipowell, with a legal education in conformity with the Equal Protection Clause. He then proceeded further to advise Justice Rutledge I would think it possible to take judicial notice of the fact that A, a law school for one student cannot be equal, even if you accept the equal protection or separate but equal doctrine, and B, the doctrine of segregation itself is, is a violation of the constitutional requirement, end quote. The clerk concluded that if there is any chance of granting relief, I would do so. Now, this memorandum's call to invalidate the segregation doctrine was, as we all know, precocious. Its suggestion that judicial notice could undo precedent established half century earlier in Plessy is nothing short of astounding. The author of the memorandum later demurred. Well, that was the common view of all the law clerks. Now, that may well be true. I have spoken with Judge Lewis Pollack, who um, succeeded this particular clerk as a clerk for Justice Rutledge. And Judge Pollack told me that in an interview when he clerked for Rutledge the following term, 
most of his peers did seem to be in favor of the courts inching towards school desegregation. Yet it must be noted that the 1948 memorandum of the Rutledge clerk, who had preceded Pollock, ventured far beyond the incrementalism that had characterized not only the court's opinions, but also the NAACP's own litigation strategy in the 1940s. The question whether the Constitution permits segregation surely <coughs> underlay Sipowell's case, as it did most legal challenges to states' maintenance of separate educational systems. But the NAACP, having decided gradually to build the case against segregation, chose not to put that forward in Sipowell. And by and large, the court seemed very comfortable and content with that choice. Indeed, my study of what of the judges, justices' papers I have been able to look at in the case so far um, revealed an internal memorandum by Justice Felix Frankfurter, where he urged his colleagues not to resolve Sipowell's mandamus petition in a manner that, quote, might again invite discussion about the issue which Thurgood Marshall skillfully did not explicitly accept or reject. Namely, is segregation constitutionally valid? Unquote. The justices' law clerks likewise worked within the gradualist framework. At least two, besides the author of this memorandum, did recommend grants in the mandamus suit. However, neither advanced the unconstitutionality of segregation itself as a reason for such a vote. And though Justice Rutledge did cast a lone vote to grant, he argued only the narrow claim that state judges had not followed the court's mandate in Sipwell and made no, motion, no mention of segregation itself. It would be another six years, of course, before the court held segregation unconstitutional in Brown versus Board of Ed. And as late as the 1952 hearing in that litigation, another clerk had objected to the, even to the prospect of such a decree. And I quote here, to the argument made by Thurgood Marshall that a majority may not deprive a minority of its constitutional right, the clerk, William H. Rehnquist, wrote in a memorandum that drew much attention when he became a justice decades later, the answer must be that while this is sound in theory, in the long run, it is the majority who will determine what the constitutional rights of the minority are, unquote. In tone and content, the two clerks' memoranda could not have diverged more. Let's fast forward now to 2007. Striking as uncon unconstitutionally discriminatory two plans to prevent resegregation of public schools, a court majority hearkened to a landmark ruling with these words. Before Brown, school children were told they could, where they could and could not go to school based on the color of their skin. Now it was just as John Paul Stevens who dissented. By failing to note that it was only black school children who were so ordered, he wrote, the majority in Seattle schools rewrites the history of one of this court's most important decisions. And then he has the coda of righteous anger that Andrew has already quoted, going so far to declare that no member of the court I joined in 1975, including, of course, Rehnquist, would have agreed with today's decision. At this juncture, it probably comes as no surprise that the justice who found the majority's 2007 decision invoking Brown a, and I quote him, cruel irony, unquote, had been the author six decades earlier of the clerk's memorandum in Sipowell. However, Stevens' authorship of the memorandum favoring desegregation does in fact come as a surprise because of the vehemence with which Justice Stevens opposed affirmative action programs early in his tenure in the court. Particularly memorable is the Fuller Love case in which the court sustained a 10% minority set-aside program benefiting, in the words of the statute, Negroes, Spanish-speaking, Orientals, Indians, Eskimos, and Aleuts. In a solo dissent, Stevens invoked our commitment to the proposition that the sovereign has a fundamental duty to govern impartially, a concept of equal justice under law that is served by the Fifth Amendment's guarantee of due process as well as by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. He wrote that the concept requires that any race-based classification be clearly identified and unquestionably legitimate. And then he questioned the legitimacy of Congress's attempt to, to identify qualifying racial 
characteristics. And then, most amazingly, in a footnote, he said, and I quote, if the national government is to make a serious effort to define racial classes by criteria that can be administered objectively, it must study precedents such as the first regulation to the Reich's citizenship law of November 14, 1935, unquote. A reference that goes on to quote that statute in English translation in large part, a reference to Nazi statutes that had defined by references to blood and race reminiscent of America's Jim Crow laws, who in Germany was a Jew. So here's the question. How is one to square Justice Stevens' opinion in full of love, his likening of Congress's plan to make amends for past discrimination with the Bundestag's move toward the worst kind of state-sponsored discrimination? How can we square that comparison with either his 1948 call for an end to segregation itself or his 2007 claim that reliance on racial classifications to maintain school diversity best honors the desegregation legacy of Brown. Put more simply, the question is this, and we've heard the question in various iterations already today. Have Justice Stevens' views on race and the law changed? Now here I have a direct quote from Justice Stevens on these kinds of issues from an ABC interview he did a year or two ago. He's asked, I believe, by uh, Jan Greenberg, how would you describe yourself? Quote, as a moderate conservative, and he chuckles, I, I don't really think I've changed. I think there have been a lot of changes in the court. Well, here's my answer to the question of whether his views on race and the law have changed. The answer is yes, and it is no. It is yes because at least since 1986, when he dissented in Wygand from the majority's rejection of racial preferences extended to minority school teachers, Stevens often has supported affirmative action programs in ways he would not have done at the beginning of his career. But it is also no because he continues to arrive at each decision within this framework of an equally impartial government and the duty of the sovereign to remain um, impartial. It is always a framework that he talks about curiously without reference to race or without exclusive reference to race. So that in the 1986 lecture where he talks at length about this, quoting Adler, he gives two examples of situations where a person's liberty and interest in not being treated less favorably than the average member of society unless there is an acceptable justification for such treat treatment. He gives two examples of when that's violated. The first is not a racial reference at all. It is when, quote, a person is branded as a felon without proper hearing. And only after stating that issue, then he says, and also when he is treated less favorably than the majority of their, his peers, simply because his skin is not of the same color as theirs. Both situations, in his view, and it's a view that he has maintained in different ways throughout his, uh, jur his jurisprudential career, are arbitrary deprivations of liberty in violation of the Due Process Clause, and that is the problem. So how are we going to try to square these different issues? Um, basically, what we're looking at is, is essentially a jurisprudential duty. You go from Sipuel to Fuller Love to Wygant and to the uh, Seattle schools. Although this may be an illustrative docu document for our purposes, um, I don't mean by any means to try to overdetermine uh, the 88-year life of a person. Um, to the extent that he has changed, that his views have altered and adjusted, we should celebrate that. I would be much more frightened if we were saying the man um, became a federal judge in 1970 and has said the same thing ever since. Um, and I don't think we can even uh, link um, biographically in a determinative way to say, oh, this event obviously explains that. But what I'm going to try to do is give you a quick run through of some biography that may get you thinking without me defining what may be some of the answers to this puzzle. You may have heard of the Conrad Hilton. I heard of it because I grew up in Chicago and I remember watching uh, the demonstrations on television that occurred during the 1968 Democratic Convention. What you may not know is it was the Stevens Hotel 
when it opened. And it opened in 1927. And the family was the family of Justice Stevens. His grandfather and his father built the hotel uh, using money from an insurance company that they had made quite a bit of money on. And they opened it. And at the time that it was open, it is, accor according to this, uh, I think this is a beer mat or something that I found, um, the world's greatest hotel. It was also the world's largest hotel. Um, in, at the time that it was open, it had a playroom, which we can see. An entire floor was devoted to a playroom for children with playground equipment. There was, uh, I think they called it a Chinese tea room. There was a barber shop, uh, a miniature golf course on the roof until they realized that Chicago is not called the Windy City for nothing and that <laughs> miniature golf could not be played on the roof. Um, and so what we need to think about is what life would have been like for the child who is the smallest in this picture. Stevens had just turned seven years old um, within weeks before the opening night, which is pictured here. And you see his parents on the left, his uh, grandparents as well, looking like uh, they're ready to go into the ballroom of the Queen Mary, um, and he and his four brothers. And this was a life that he lived as a young child. Um, they had a townhouse in Hyde Park. The father had run the LaSalle Hotel before they did the Stevens Hotel, so he had lived a very posh, um, about as posh of a jazz age life as you can get. When the hotel opened, there was much publicity. Amelia Earhart came, Charles Lindbergh came. The Vice President of the United States was the first visitor to the hotel. Um, and throughout his young life, he had the benefit of his father's connections, abilities to um, really live as an elite in Chicago. But the story is not a happy story in the end because um, when the stock market crashed in 1929, so did the Stevens family fortunes in ways that are incredibly uh, poignant. Not just that they lost all their money, not just that they lost their hotel, but the father and the grandfather were indicted for fraud. They became the, if you will, Enron uh, issue of the day, in part because some of the real robber barons of the stock market crash, like Samuel Insel, had fled the country. And the Stevenses stayed, and they were the only ones left to be put on trial. Um, and so what happened was, for probably a period of two to three years, when Stevens is maybe 10 to 12 years old, the front page of the Tribune and the back page, which was the graphics page, were at least once a week more stories about the Stevens family in different ways. Um, as I said, it was only, I, I, excuse me, the indictment actually was the father, the uncle, and the grandfather. The uncle committed suicide, also splashed all over the Chicago Tribune uh, while the case was pending. He couldn't take the pressure of it anymore. The grandfather suffered a stroke um, and was not able to stand trial. It was a permanently debilitating stroke. And so the father stood trial alone and was convicted, interestingly enough, jury by, or Judge Jeff, by a jury of his peers um, in Chicago for fraud essentially, for commingling of the funds of the insurance company to try to keep the hotel afloat. What is remarkable about this story is that almost one year to the day later, the Illinois Supreme Court unanimously overturned the conviction and reversed the conviction without remand, and so that his father was freed. Of course, he never went back to owning the hotel. He actually ran a concession at the Century of Progress World's Fair, and Justice Stevens' first job was selling Banbury tarts at the English Village at the World's Fair. And it is there that he learned to love Shakespeare, because he would sneak into the Shakespeare tent and watch the plays when he was supposed to be working. Um, and so this is the family story, that they were really at the top of Chicago society and fell very, very far. They continued to have some um, good life 
shall I say. And we all know that Justice Stevens is an inveterate Cubs fan, and you may know that he actually was present at the World Series game where Babe Ruth pointed to the stands and said where he was going to uh, pitch, or excuse me, hit the ball as a home run to uh, defeat the Cubs, and he did. Um, and Stevens said that he actually saw that because it's somewhat um, unsure if Ruth did that, but the justice is sure that he did. Years, years later, just as Stevens got to throw out the first pitch, and with, with characteristic behavior, um, he practiced in a park in Washington with his daughter because he was quite um, adamant that if he was going to do it, that ball was going over the plate, or he was not going up there. <laughs> what happens after this? Well, he becomes a student. He was a graduate student in English when World War I hit, or World War II hit. And he was recruited by a dean who was working for a forerunner of the CIA to become a code breaker. And he actually enlisted, as Ken knows, Ken has written about this in his book, he enlisted um, and did his physical the, uh, within hours before Pearl Harbor. And I think as Ken reports in his book, he, he sometimes jokes that it was he who had precipitated the Japanese attack. <laughs> Um, but he goes on to serve and, and assist in breaking the Japanese code in World War II. He received a Bronze Star for doing that. He comes back and he clerks for Justice Rutledge. And that's where the Sipowo case comes from. And so what I'd like to do break, is to break here and just try to answer a few of my questions before uh, I pass it on to Teresa and invite you to ask further questions. You have them afterwards. Why would it be that Justice Stevens would subsume equality into liberty? And I have a few ideas that I get th I'd like to throw out there. One is, he had no exposure in his young life to people of color. I have asked him about this in interviews, and I said, well, surely you must have had servants or there would have been people working. This was Chicago, after all. And he said, absolutely not. The servants were typically Scandinavian. I have now read histories of Chicago at this time in the 20s. The loop, no matter what the position was, people were not employed if they were people of color, not, not even in the most menial positions in the hotel were there people of color. In fact, there was an undefined uh, line that everyone in Chicago knew about uh, where they could and could not go. And where they could not go if they were black was inside the loop in essentially the financial nerve center of the city. And so a boy growing up at this time and going to university, high, or university lab school down in Hyde Park, which was also extreme, exclusively white, could have grown up without really encountering race as an issue, even though he was born nine months after the 1919 fatal riots, the race riots in Chicago. So we are not going to say that there were not racial problems, but he could have grown up isolated from them in a real serious way. Um, and I think that's a remarkable change for us to talk about, not only in his view, but in the world, because of course we know Malia and Sasha Obama were probably the most famous recent students of the university lab school that Justice Stevens went to. So things have changed in a way that we forget sometimes. There is a kind of discrimination that he was exposed to, however, and very familiar with, and that was very much in the air among white shall I say, Protestant elites in the late 1940s, and that's the discrimination against Jews in the profession. Gentleman's Agreement, the movie that challenges this, this in a popular culture way, came out in 1947, the same year that he began clerking for Justice Rutledge. His mentors were people like Mortimer Adler and Nathaniel Nathanson, um, who was a very, very important mentor of his, uh, his uh, first con law professor at Northwestern. He had just fought a war to stop the worst kind of discrimination against the Jews. And so I don't think it's surprising to see that in, in cases like Full of Love and in other references that we can find, he often talks about what we today think of ra as a racial discrimination problem through the lens of his very uh, clear understanding of um, treatment toward Jews at the time that he was forming his own professional identity. In fact, one of his named partners was, uh, per, uh, I think there was a Catholic, a Jew, and a Protestant, and that was quite unusual at the time they formed their firm. And I have quoted in my other article a note that he wrote to Justice Rutledge explaining that he had 
decided to go to Jenner and Block as his first firm in Chicago because, quote, unlike most of the other successful outlets, they have Jews in the partnership. And so this was something that mattered to him, and it's not at all surprising that a kind of segregation that he understood became the lens for him to think about in ways that may be different from sort of the, the current um, about discrimination. The second one is one that Andrews talked about. I think that he recognizes that the more specific guarantee, i.e. equal protection, is not necessarily the more protective guarantee any more than a framework of levels of scrutiny will protect the discriminated individual more than would a very hard look by a very good judge. And there is a reference that I would like to uh, bring us back to in part because my students in Kanla and I have been studying it this, this week. It's the Japanese internment cases. You learn about justices from the cases they keep citing. Justice Stevens cites Hirabayashi an awful lot. He uh, worked for the justice who is most famous for his dissent in Yamashita, in, in which um, Justice Rutledge essentially breaks from his previous uh, sustaining of the government's treatment of people of Japanese ancestry or Japanese identity in Korematsu and Hirabayashi, and gives an impassioned dissent in the Yamashita case against the capital conviction of that person. And so the citation of Hirabayashi, which if you recall, was one of the very first invocations of equal protection, but it was done not through the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, but the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause, is a case that he looks to. And it's surely a case, as was Korematsu, where we see the court mouthing the words of equal protection and then denying them to the individual. And then the last thing I'd like to leave you with is is his own personal experience. His first encounter as a very young child with the government that was supposed to be impartial was to have his father thrown in jail, to be arrested and pulled out of the family household um, and splashed over the, the television, or not the television, of course, but the, the newspapers. Um, the and radio. The radio. <laughs> and to have you know, his entire family crumble as well as the family fortune crumble and to have another incident that he has recently talked about, and, and so I feel that I can talk about, which is that the family was the victim of a crime. Because the Tribune wrote so much about their family fortune that some thugs thought, they've got millions in the basement, let's go get it. And so a group of uh, men dressed up as uh, U Chicago police officers and federal agents and came to the door with machine guns when the family was home in the evening, and they lined them all up against the wall. and. Um, at first, the boys thought this was a bit of a game, and the only thing they could find close to money was Justice Stevens' strong box, and they actually made him undo the combination so that they could make sure that there wasn't money in the strong box. And at one point, he, he has retold me this, and he was reliving the incident, um, they became scared and became aware that it was no longer a game. It was diffused because a neighbor came over and said sort of through the window to his father, Ernest, what's all the commotion over there? And his father had the presence of mind at the time that these robbers were getting quite uh, desperate because they, there was nothing to steal and they had Tommy guns. Um, his father had the presence of mind to say, oh, this is officer, officer so-and-so. You're just leaving now, aren't you, officer? Thanks for coming by and making sure everything's OK. And the robbers took it as their exit strategy. Um, <laughs> But here you have an incident where the, in, the, in the context of his parents um, going through this family tragedy of the indictment and the pending trial of having a very real failure to protect by the government. And so that all of that happened to him when he was supposed to be a child of privilege um, and not suffering the burdens of color. And I think that having experienced and then also as a pro bono lawyer dealing with a man who was tortured in order to get his confession extracted from him by the Chicago police officers, who also was not um, an African American. Um, and seeing the way the government can fail in its duty to govern, even when race isn't one of the tipping factors, may be part of the reason why he um, sees the story in a little different way. And I think perhaps the fact that his family was saved in a way by the Illinois Supreme Court, 
says something about the role that he sees of judges and the importance of judges to quote Madison as being the bulwarks of, um, of justice when the minority is being harmed by the majority. And so I'll leave it there and thank you for your attention. Ms. Roseborough is going to, we've heard about the background which obviously influences the justice, we've heard about, about his writings, uh, and now we're going to hear about litigation. How do, you, <laughs> how, how do you put that into effect? Thank you, everybody. Don't, don't be alarmed. Don't let the presence of one of Snoopy's lawyers uh, concern you. I'm here to express my own views, uh, not, <laughs> unfortunately, for your sakes, those of Snoopy. I'm going to look at Justice Stevens' views through the lens of Bush v. Gore. And I'm going to borrow from Professor Andrew Siegel's observation that Justice Stevens' writings on equal protection involve a lot more showing than telling. So I'll use a little show and tell with uh, the voting machines that were at work in Bush v. Gore to highlight the wisdom of Justice Stevens' restraint in declining to find an equal protection violation in the statewide recount ordered by the Florida Supreme Court. I want to first note, though, how proud I am to be here for this event. As a distinct beneficiary of the civil rights movement in this country, I'm honored to be a part of the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the dedication of King Hall, and at least by implication, also a celebration of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. There's no doubt in my mind that Dr. King would be very proud of this institution that you have named for him, and proud of the bold and committed acts that have been done for these halls in the interest of creating a more just society. Dr. King noted that the moral arc of the universe is long, but inclined toward justice. I'm sure he would regard King Hall as one of those dense singularities pulling the light path of that arc in the right direction. I'm also be proud to be a part of a program honoring a man that I respect so much, Justice John Paul Stevens, and I especially indebted to Diane for thinking of me and inviting me to participate. Uh, my co-clerks and I uh, refer to Justice Stevens as the boss. And while this reference was literally true, it was also our acknowledgement of his unparalleled intellect and his incredible command of the law. The title boss also for us reflected the privilege we felt to be working for someone of such incredible character. Justice Stevens is truly one of those people, I think my uh, co-clerks and fellow clerks in the room would back me in saying that you'd be just as happy to work for were he the proprietor of a gasoline station as, as a justice of the United States Supreme Court. One of my great opportunities as a practicing lawyer was to argue a case before the United States Supreme Court and it just happened to be during the time that Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist was injured and not taking the bench and Justice Stevens was acting as Chief Justice. So I got to open my argument with Justice Stevens and may it please the court. I'm confident to this moment that he winked at me when I said that. <laughs> it turned out to be the highlight of the argument. <laughs> Even though I was representing, you know, disabled children in foster care, one would think I was on the side of the angels and managed to lose the case nine to zip. Much is said and will be said of Justice Stevens' perspicacity. His keen insights, his searching quest to know all of a thing before he judges it, and his intellectual prowess are distinctive. And his memory, as you saw from the video clip, is incredible. You may think that he did a lot of research in trying to figure out what cases he had discussed with Diane and what she'd done in those cases, or the footnote that he uh, cited Dan Farber in, but those types of memories and recollections are always at the core. I got a chance to talk to him, and I feel Jeff's pain when he says how hard it is to find those windows when you can discuss something with him when you don't have a case that you're involved in before him. Uh, but I got a chance to talk to him a couple of days after the inauguration. I thought it would be great to take advantage of the moment to congratulate him on his, his, his part of the uh, swearing-in ceremony right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and he um, took the moment to ask me whether I recall this case in which he contends that I persuaded him to add a rather lengthy footnote to an otherwise short and concise opinion. Uh, when I gave him one of my, you know, blank, what are you talking about looks, he described the opinion to me in some detail and still failed to draw recollection uh, from me and was kind enough to say I must be mistaken. But of course he was, and I went back to the books. I found the case he was talking about. But he just has this incredibly agile mind that serves him in so many great ways. 
It's notable, however, that Justice Stevens' intellect carries with it no condescension, no disregard for the views of others, no hesitance to defer to the judgment, the labor, and the goodwill of others, and no bias. In particular, he harbors no insecurity about the ability of others who approach an issue in good faith to reach the right result. This abiding respect for others has not only made him a great boss, it has constantly shaped his approach to cases and informed his intellectual preference for context over doctrine. As a general matter, and many legal scholars, including those beside me, have acknowledged the difficulty of applying traditional labels to Justice Stevens. He eschews structure and doctrinal notions that might produce bias toward a particular class of outcomes and a particular class of cases in favor of a more contextual approach of studying each statute, each case, each constitutional <coughs> principle for an understanding that is direct and in its own context to achieve the paramount goal, which is a correct conclusion of law. He seeks nothing more and nothing less in every case. In examining Justice Stevenson's equal protection cases, as Andy described earlier, he's noted that he defies easy characterization and noted his rejection of the tiered approach to equal protection analysis in favor of a context-driven approach to determining whether or not a decision is rational, whether or not it appears to have come from an impartial government. In Justice Stevens' vision, one cannot determine whether a government's actions were rational and impartial without knowing the full context in which the government acted. Let me turn now to a discussion of Justice Stevens' rejection of the equal protection argument made in Bush v. Gore and provide to you through an examination of the punch card ballots and voting machines that issue in that case a pragmatic confirmation of the wisdom of that judgment. Now, I have colleagues, I hope they've passed out to your own ballots. Get ready to be excited. We're going to make some chads here. <laughs> but first, it bears noting that of some due weight that seven justices found the order of the Florida Supreme Court regarding a statewide recount of most of the ballots count, counted in Florida in the 2000 election to violate the Equal Protection Clause. Faced with a challenge brought by then Vice President Gore to the Florida Secretary of State's certification of then Governor Bush as the winner of Florida's electoral college votes, the Florida Supreme Court held that a statewide manual required, uh, recount was required to affect the legislative policy that every citizen's vote be counted whenever possible. Every ballot, the Florida Supreme Court held, that reflected a clear indication of the intent of the voter as determined by the county canvassing board had to be counted as a legal vote. Outrageous, I know, but that was their holding. Seven justices concluded that in ordering a statewide recount governed by no standard more precise than whether the intent of the voter could be discerned, the Florida Supreme Court fell below the minimum requirements of due process and equal protection. According to the per curiam opinion, the recurring recount mechanisms and standards implemented in response to the Florida Supreme Court's command that a vote be legally cast if the intent of the voter be discerned fails to provide necessary specific standards to ensure its equal application. Noting the differing standards applied by the counties to determine whether and how to count hanging chads, dimpled chads, pregnant chads, one quarter chads, two corner chads, three corner chads, whether to include overvotes or not to include overvotes, the court said that the recount process is inconsistent with the minimum procedures necessary to protect the fundamental right of each voter in the special instances of a statewide recount under the authority of a single state judicial officer. Now, I don't want by my tone to minimize the force of the ruling. Um, as Justice Stevens itself acknowledges in his dissent, the use of differing substandards for determining voter intent in different counties apparently using similar voting systems does raise serious constitutional concerns. For Justice Stevens, those concerns were ameliorated by the presence of a single judicial officer who would adjudicate the objections to the counting of specific ballots. But it's not that those concerns didn't exist. Um, and if you visualize across the state, the Florida Supreme Court issues a ruling that requires the recounting of most of the ballots in the state, but not all of them, uh, that determines that 
undervotes are going to be included, but not overvotes. That, but in counties where recounts have already been included, that included overvotes, that those votes need not be recounted, and the full tally of those counts, those counties can be included, and which gives no guidance to the county officials trying to effectuate the policies, uh, the pronouncements of the Florida Supreme Court, other than see what you can figure out about the intent of the voter from the ballots you have before you, after you already know how much those counties have, have struggled with that very determination does raise uh, serious concerns. But I think Justice Stevens was comforted not only by the fact that there was a single person, a single judicial officer who was going to act for the whole state in determining whether or not to uphold objections to the uh, counting of legal balance, but also his reliance on and his um, faith in that impartial judicial officer to reach the right conclusion and to give effect to equal protection in uh, making judgments about ballots. One of the things I want to illustrate to you today is that there's perfectly good factual pragmatic reasons why it was important to leave to the individual county canvassing boards the determination of whether or not a particular ballot reflected the intent of a voter in that county that have nothing to do with uh, and would have been erased by a single statewide rule that, for example, said dimple chats do or don't count. And I'm going to illustrate that for with the machines. But it's important to note that this is an opinion in which Justice Stevens gave vent to some of the righteous indignation that Andy referred to. And his ultimate lament in the case was that the loser in the election is perfectly clear, and it's the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. And that, to him, was the most telling indictment of Bush v. Gore. It's backhand to the Florida Supreme Court and to the independent judicial officer uh, appointed to oversee the recount process. So let's see some of the evidence of Justice Stevens' wisdom here. Let me begin by getting you to, hopefully every other person or so has um, a ballot. This is a standard punch card um, ballot. It bears noting that at the time of Bush v. Gore, some 49% of the U.S. voting population voted on punch card ballots. It was far and away the most um, popular single voting system in the United States. It had been created by IBM uh, in the 1960s. IBM uh, created the punch card as a device for programming computers. Uh, and when it uh, came up with the innovation of a perforated punch card, meaning you, can, uh, you see on your, your voting cards here, if you look on the back, that um, the punch out spots in the cards have been perforated rather than being left to be punched out by um, uh, punch card machines. I don't know if you guys ever saw punch card operators or data punch operators that used to sit with the large stacks of cards and without looking at anything, punch holes in data cards. Well, these cards were an amazing innovation because they didn't require those machines. They had these pre-perforations, uh, and that allowed them to be used for voting. So IBM created this device called the Vote-O-Matic. <laughs> but before I show you how the Vote-O-Matic worked, let me first show you how to create a chat. <laughs> I want you to take your ballot and then take your stylus, which I hope you have a paper clip nearby. Andy, I want you to do this. Andy was a clerk during Bush v. Gore, but he's never seen one of these machines. This is important. And press one of those two down. Now, Take your stylus and punch the card and try to uh, separate the chat from the card just with your paper clip. And then pass it to your neighbor and let them give it a college try. You will note it's not possible <laughs> just by sake of a, making a punch to separate a chat from the card. You would note if you try to play with it, you can create a three-corner tab by angling your um, stylus a little bit. It's really easy to create a two-corner tab. A really talented person might get a three-corner one out of it, but you can't separate it. 
In order to separate the tread from the car, it requires a separate mechanical process. That can either be your fingers, you can pull it off from the card. But part of the purpose of this votomatic device was to achieve that second part of the process and to separate the chad from the back of the card. Because at the end of the day, the way these votes were counted is that they were run through a machine, the punch cards were run through a machine, and a light would shine through the card. And where there was a hole, as revealed by the light shining through, the machine would count a vote. So it's important to the way that the tabulation machine worked that a chad be fully separated and or flipped back on the card in a way that allowed light to shine through the card when it went through the counting machine. Now this is a, this um, machine, you know, one of my great fortunes is I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and Fulton County, and Fulton County, God bless them, uses the votatronic machines from the 1960s. <laughs> And so I was able to get from Fulton County, from the 2000 election, uh, the original uh, ballot used in Fulton County on the original voter tranic as it had been uh, designed by IBM. And it still says the legend here, voter, uh, IBM Votertronic on here. And you see that the basic ballot is a book that fits inside here. You flip the page. And then it shows you the candidates that you can vote for. And it has an arrow. And you punch the hole next to the spot for the candidate you want to vote for. And you will notice in this ballot, as in all proper ballots, and we'll leave aside the conversation about one other thing, so, that the punch is to the right of the name of the candidate you want to, to select. The, the other side of the ballot is intentionally left blank. Now this machine, in order to achieve the second part of the process of um, separating the chad from the card has a rubber T-zone underneath the ballot. There are two things you're seeing here. One is you're seeing a plastic template. The plastic template was a subsequent addition to the, the device that was added to keep people from being able to punch sideways through the card. The template has physical holes which were intended to make sure that people had to punch the stylus straight up and down. And once they did that, Their stylus would punch a hole through the card and straight into this rubber T-zone, which would then hold the chad. And when you remove the stylus and then pulled your card out of the machine, you would be left with holes. So the card would go in like this. It would be seated on these little points here. You go through the template, through the ballot, punch your hole. And if all went well, the rubber strips would hold your chad and you would come up with a perfectly detached chad. Now, at the time of the 2000 elections, these votertronic machines were, were manufactured in Florida by no less than five different manufacturers. The IBM's patent had expired. Um, and each of these manufacturers did something a little different with their machines. They used slightly different materials for the T-zone. They used slightly different materials for the ABS plastic templates. They had slightly different design in their um, styluses. And uh, here I have, and you can look at these over lunch, two machines from two different Florida counties. One's from Collier County, Florida, and one is from Palm Beach County, Florida. The Collier County machine, you'll note, is really clean, really nice, looks like it's had its annual maintenance. Um, no chads fall out when you shake it. And what you have to do with these machines, whether it was intended by all the manufacturers to happen, is that you had to clean and oil these T-zones in every machine after every election. You had to shake out all of the chads. And you had to store them in a clean, dry place. You can only guess how often that happened. <laughs> so and you can see this one has a hole that the chads fall out um, pretty automatically. Um, from And it also has an extra long but thin handled um, stylus. Some of the counties had styluses that had even longer ends and softer tips, which were intended to make a more blunt punch and make it easier to separate a whole chad from the card. This machine from Palm Beach County is a little bit dirtier. It was manufactured by ESL 
uh, Corporation, slightly different design from the one used for Collier County. Um, but you can see if you look at the casing here, you'll see that there's rust formed over um, part of it, showing that the machine was exposed um, to mildew. If you try to punch a hole through the Collier County one, you'll find that your stylus goes in perfectly and there's perfect alignment. If you try to do that on this one, you'll find that in some areas of the ballot that works fine, but in some areas you'll re encounter resistance. If you let chads build up in these machines and you try to push through, nothing would happen. You'd meet the chads. Or if the rubber and the template weren't perfectly aligned, when you tried to push through, you'd get an indention, which was a dimpled chad. Um, or you might push through all the way with a, if you had a, um, what they call an overexpanded plastic uh, template. Some of these plastic templates were very um, uh, responsive to heat, so, which you don't have in Florida, of course. But where it were to get warm, <laughs> sometimes these things would expand and later contract so that they shifted in their housing. And you could get a situation where you would um, be able to punch a hole all the way through um, a machine because of improper alignment. So in reality, it would be possible for Palm Beach County to say, we're seeing hundreds of dimpled chats. Those must reflect a voter trying to accomplish something. Whereas in Collier County, they might not see any dimpled chads. And if they saw one, it would be perfectly ridiculous for them to decide that this one dimpled chad uh, ballot reflected the intent of the voter. It might be a defect. It might be someone who really tried to stop a vote or something else. But we're not seeing enough of them to think that this reflects the intent of the voter. So actually, the standard that the Florida Supreme Court attempted to use of allowing each county canvassing board to judge what was happening in its own individual county to determine whether or not the intent of the voter could be discerned was actually more uh, protective of the rights to vote and of equal protection than the uniform standard that the majority of the Supreme Court suggested would have been more consistent with equal protection. So once again, no surprise to most of us, Justice Stevens got it right. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Let me just ask a question or two from each of the panelists, and uh, I'm told we can go a little bit beyond 145. I'll open it up for two or three questions maybe from the audience. Uh, uh, first, Ms. Roseboro, uh, I was on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and we were the only official group that actually had hearings. And, and I must say that uh, I was involved in my uh, earlier life as a lawyer in a challenged election, and the standard of California was exactly the same. Um, the opposing counsel and I agreed on practically every ballot in terms of the intent of the voter. Uh, so I never could quite understand, frankly, uh, the reasoning of the Supreme Court, and I, perhaps editorially, I must say that I considered the, their opinion a disgrace. Uh, so so what, uh, what basis was there for, for their opinion? What theoretical basis was there for their opinion? Well, one of the things we, we all have seen this played out on CNN, right? Every day we were watching the counts happen in different counties. We were watching the people trying to count the ballots, having to go up to the county canvassing board and asking them to review a particular ballot to see if they could see what was intended. Uh, we were all being introduced to this terminology with respect to the, the dimpling of, of chads. And I think that the uh, Republican Party had done a great job of introducing this notion of ballot degradation that the, the very process of recounting the ballots, uh, because it sometimes changed the result, because it detached the chads, I think sometimes you saw people eating the chads uh, and stuff, that, they, that any process that allowed a ballot to change from one, physically change from one count process to another must reflect some infirmity in the voting process. And, I, and to, to give some um, credit to the majority of the Supreme Court, they were not alone in, in believing that. There were other cases, uh, state court cases largely, where there had been challenges to these machines on exactly those grounds, that there had to be something uh, infirm about a voting process that relied on ballots whose constitution makeup could change from one cycle to another, another in a count or a recount. So in part, I think the court was reflecting that uh, notion and sort of clinging to uh, this concept of one person, one vote, we're saying, 
how can it be fair for a dimpled Chad to count in Palm Beach County and when it doesn't count in Collier County? And I think, you know, as a failure of the, of the Gore lawyers, we never introduced into the record any information or very little information about how these machines actually operated. I have no knowledge today whether any of the justices were personally familiar with how the machines uh, worked. And I think it made it even easier for them to perceive that uh, these distinctions and how you counted the ballot were significant at a constitutional level. Well, so my problem is that I actually had some notion about how they work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I have a, a question of Professor Heyman. Uh, I enjoyed the background, and my issue is, my question is this. One of the lessons of the Depression, it seems to me that, that uh, bad things can happen to good people. Uh, and uh, of course, he, he, he lived during the, the Depression. I, and, and somehow, in the last 20, 30 years, we've forgotten that. Everybody says, you know, work hard, every, everything will be okay, go to school, get a job. Uh, now we find that maybe it doesn't always work that way. Uh, but but that's but uh, I just think that that lesson was an important one. I just wondered how that if, if he if, if he learned the same lesson that I think many of us did. I actually was a kid during the depression, so I remember that. Well, I, I haven't asked him about the depression specifically. Uh, I've asked him specifically more about the story of the Stevens Hotel. But I will say he reveres his father um, in in in. Um, the true sense of that term. And so I think that he might be able to articulate in one sentence the story of his family that good, bad things happen to good people because he has no doubt that uh, his father was a good person. In fact, having read the Tribune uh, press releases, his father was uh, very good at getting press notices for both the hotels he ran. Um, including doing a poet, probably what was probably the first poetry slam in 1918 or something at the LaSalle Hotel, and uh, you know, uh, going to the ladies' clubs and uh, doing the uh, patriotic thing when World War I happened, and always the hotel was in the press for that. And I think I said something to the fact that, well, your father seemed to have been quite a promoter, and he took umbrage at that word. Um, it was the wrong word to use, although I was not being critical. And so I think that was the vision with which in, with, within which he'd see it. Now, I should say something about the Lafrana case, though, which is the one I referred to at the end, because that's another um, bad things can happen to good people. And it, it is probably, I believe, the only criminal case that Stevens did. He did it, if I recall correctly, because uh, Professor Nathanson um, arranged for him to take this case by appointment very young, young in his career. Um, and it was uh, an Italian immigrant who did not speak English, uh, was maybe 18, 19 years old, was arrested for murder. Um, in those days, there was no right to an interpreter, but the uh, arresting officer who happened to be Italian very helpfully interpreted um, for the defendant throughout the proceedings, so we can only imagine what the nature, or the veracity of the testimony was. But Stephen was, was appointed post-conviction um, to deal with this issue of whether the confession um, had been extracted illegally. And he actually was skeptical, notwithstanding his father's own experience. He, at that point in his life, assumed that it was an overstated claim. And so when he went to meet with the defendant in prison, he was cautious about the claims that we were being made. He said until um, the man had been hanged by his wrists. I mean, th th this resonates with Guantanamo too. He actually had a client who was treated in some of the ways that people were at Guantanamo. The man had been hanged by his wrists for a prolonged period of time um, until he finally confessed. And Stephen said it was when he told me that his shoulders hurt, that the joint here was what hurt, that I knew he was telling the truth. Because in my imagining of it, it would have been the wrists. But it was only at that moment that he then actually believed his client. But it's a, he has referred to that case many times in his remark. And again, a powerful personal example of the system going very, very wrong in an in unconscionable manner. Yeah, I, I just uh, seems to me those those experiences must influence all kinds of things later. And, uh, and he did win the post conviction petition. Ah, uh -huh. even better. Uh, Pat Siegel, uh, 
You speak uh, with uh, some admiration, it seems to me, of the uh, unmediated justice. Uh, I had a case when I was on the Supreme Court having to do with equity, which has to do with fairness. And so I read opinions going back hundreds of years, sort of a, a fun case about how does a judge uh, measure fairness? And the cases basically <coughs> say it don't depend on your own views. It's your job as a judge to figure out what the community sense is of fairness. So I just wondered whether in uh, unmediated justice, whether you're depending too much on your own notions of justice and liberty and freedom instead of the community. And is that a good thing? You know, it's fair enough. I mean, to some extent, the Equal Protection Clause calls on that or creates that problem whatever, method, whatever methodologies yeah. you use because equality is not, does not have inherent normative con content. It involves different normative theories um, and you need something more. You need something more. Um, but one of the persistent criticisms of unmitigated, con unmediated constitutional interpretation, um, one of the assumptions of the critics, I guess, was that it involved raw judicial value selection more than other methodologies. Um, and kind of the part of the Ford of this I didn't summarize here today, um, I kind of contrasted Justice Stevens's opinions against those of other justices using other methodologies um, for consistency with them as well as consistency among his own opinions and in a non-empirical way or a non-quantitative way found that I think that criticism is overstated. Um, I did, though, suggest at the end, and that's ultimately, I think my piece was only a um, modified endorsement of his approach. Um, I did say that there was a disquieting consequence here, or a disquieting um, side to the use of unmediated interpretation, which was that unmediated interpretation at some level ultimately meant that every tough decision was a decision for the Supreme Court. Even if the judgments were good, even if the judgments ultimately were in accord with what other people might think, or people using other methodologies might think, ultimately it gave less guidance to um, other officials, to non-judges and to lower court judges than a system, of, a, system of, um, a system that uses mediating doctrine does. Um, there are trade-offs against that. I mean, I think Justice Stevens ultimately achieves um, a more, more coherent and a more just set of results, um, but certainly in the classic um, rules versus standards debate form, um, you know you have to acknowledge those costs. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. If I could add to that, and I think this is it's a slide that I didn't put up, but there's obvious tension in Justice Stevens. There is only one equal protection clause framework, um, and even his articulation of liberty, it the whole system depends on having very good judges. And um, what the mediation does, in part, is to act as a buffer against judges that aren't very good. And we can understand why he has supreme confidence, um, with good reason, in his ability to be a very good judge day in and day out for something like 35 years now. Um, but not all of his colleagues can be so described. And so I think that the difficulty, and, and I would say not simply the, the other eight, but all the way through the court systems. And so the difficulty is, if you don't have some kind of framework, um, are you giving far too much discretion to people who don't deserve it? The problem, of course, is, as he points out in Seattle schools and elsewhere, is that the framework is, is, is a sham at this point and is so easily manipulable that it becomes a way for judges um, to perhaps look like they're doing uh, judicial work, but, instead, but, but, but not really doing justice at the end of the day through the mediated approach either. So you know, methodology may not be the problem. The problem is who it is we're putting on the bench. Yes, so, so often it appears to be a neutral decision, and yet we know that it hasn't been. Well, I confess from my own experience, I could go on for a couple of hours. So let, let me open up for, for just, we're, we're at, our, at our time. So let, let's take two or three uh, questions, and, and that's it, I'm sorry to say. Uh, questions for, for the panel? Ah, everybody must be hungry. Um, oh, uh, uh, well, I have a quick uh, question for Diane. Oh, good, good. <laughs> One of the things I've always been impressed with Justice Stevens is that about is his absolute passion for the structure of government and the role of the courts and in particular his um, singular respect for the role of the judiciary and, and his uh, 
importance to him of keeping the judiciary distinct from the other branches of government, even to the point of avoiding sort of what might be considered routine ceremonial engagements. And where does that passion for government and its structure fit into the liberty, equality, security paradigm that you charted? Well, as I suggested, I think the fact that he had such a personal uh, uh, relationship to the Illinois Supreme Court so early is important, although as Ken Manister knows, he had another relationship to the Illinois Supreme Court later that was not good. He was the chief investigator um, for a scandal when judges essentially were selling their votes on the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, but I will point to um, one of our colleagues who is not here today is Cliff Sloan, uh, who is now a lawyer in Washington. He was the head of uh, the Slate Empire for a while. He has just published a book uh, called The Great Decision on Marbury versus Madison, along with another author. And Justice Stevens was the moderator at the uh, book launch in Washington last week. You can find this on the web, I think, on C-SPAN. Um, and revealed that Marbury is his favorite case ever. And that <laughs> Professor Nathanson spent months, yes, con law students, listen, months studying every facet of the one case called Marbury versus Madison. Um, and that Stevens himself struggled with that. And, and it, it, it has to be the birth of his love of constitutional law because this is one of his favorite professors. And of course, Mar Marbury is all about John Marshall articulating a vision of the court and its role. And so that new piece of information that we learned from Cliff's book um, sheds yet another light in answer to your question, Teresa. Good question. I must say that it seems to me that when we're talking about unmediated justice, we're talking about being practical about whether at the end of the day you have justice. And I frankly see so many opinions where there's an appearance of justice, but we know that the, at, at the end of the day, there is no justice. So I feel a great admiration for a justice who looks at the end of the day in terms of whether we really have liberty and justice and fairness for everybody. Well, with that, let's thank the, 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 the panel. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you this afternoon. Just a quick